So let me share my screen and uh, in 10 minutes tell you about my life in biological physics. And I want to start with uh, the beginning. So, uh, so where did I start out? Um, I started out uh, in Hollywood. Uh, this is my, my father and mother, and they were both actors, um, starting out in New York and then in, in California. And this is my father in an early episode of The Twilight Zone. And um, my mother's career didn't go that far, but my father stuck with it and uh, has the distinction of being one of the few actors who was both in Star Trek here about to be vaporized um, and later uh, in Star Wars. And this time he's better armed. He, got, he was ready this time uh, as the voice of Boba Fett, the bounty hunter. Um, so it was, it was a surprise given this genetic background uh, that I ended up here uh, as an undergraduate at Caltech. Um, and uh, I decided at some stage that I was going to be a physics major uh, because I had the impression that it was hard, but that if you started out in physics, then everything else would be easier afterwards. And I, I actually think that was true. Uh, some, some of my experiences at Caltech have never been repeated in terms of the overall level of difficulty I found. Um, but I went on from there after my degree in physics to this place, which is a beautiful picture of Cornell up there on Ithaca up above the Finger Lakes and had a, a, a wonderful time uh, and actually had the distinction of going on sabbatical twice while I was a graduate student. Uh, once to the KITP in Santa Barbara, which was something of a formative experience. Uh, and my advisor took six graduate students with him uh, much to the dismay of everyone in Santa Barbara, but he was a very kind advisor in that regard. And later uh, to Ohio State, uh, where uh, I didn't look like this, looked a lot flatter, but that was my second sabbatical when John Wilkins left. Um, but I had a great time in graduate school, including those two sabbaticals, uh, doing condensed matter theory. And that's what I continued here at MIT, um, where I uh, continued working on semiconductor structures at very low temperature and quantum effects uh, and worked closely in partnership with this guy, Igal Mayer. And this is the beginning of a theme that I wanna to touch on this evening, which is the importance of long-term collaboration. So Igal and I met when we were postdocs uh, and we continued to work together to this day. Igal didn't look like that when I first met him. He was a kid, um, but he still, he still has great hair. And I have to say that this collaborations that I've had over the years have been really the best part of science for me. And I wanna thank Igal and I'll thank other people during the course of my, my very short presentation of my life. Um, going on from MIT, I still hadn't touched biology. I thought this was not something that physicists did um, until I ended up at this place. And this is my experience in industry. I was working at the NEC Research Institute and it looks, it's a, it was about as industrial as it looks. Like there is a nice lake there and a beautiful building. And we did not do anything for NEC Corporation, I'm afraid. We had a great deal of freedom. Uh, we had budgets and we had unlimited parking, which you can't see in the back there. But that was the real ivory tower. That was, that was truly stress-free science. Um, but again, I was very fortunate with the people I met there and um, here are two who had a big influence on me. This is Chow Tang, who I ended up working together with for many years. Chow is now in Peking University. And Hao Li, who we hired at a, as a postdoc at some point. And it was this that led me into biology. I was working away on a, some Feynman diagrams in my office. And these two guys were in the office next to me and they were arguing about something in Chinese, which would not have bothered me at all because I don't speak Chinese. But every third or fourth word was in English. It had something to do with proteins. There was a protein, there was a residue, there was a, a funnel, there was a free energy and it was making me crazy. So I basically went door, next door to sort of to make them be quiet. And they said, well, you know, we're studying this stuff on proteins and proteins are a complex system, but maybe physicists can do something. And my first reaction was this was a waste of time. Physicists should never mess with anything in biology. It was too unreproducible. Uh, but they said, well, I don't know about real biology, but there are these simple lattice models. And I would say, 
we started with something like this. This is our model of a protein. And, and it really owes a lot to Ken Dill, who was one of the other living history speakers, because it, it was at that moment that Ken had written some papers about lattice proteins and that you could really learn something about real proteins from studying these simple models, which looked a little bit like the Ising model. There were two types of residues that lived on a lattice. And that was the beginning. It started out as a hobby uh, and, and grew from there. And it grew for many reasons, one of which was due to this guy who will be familiar to many in your audience, Bill Bialik, who was also at NEC, who was already all in in biological physics. Uh, but among the other things that Bill was doing besides writing great papers, he was, he was bringing biological physics to the rest of us. And so he had a series of symposia that he organized called, you can't really see it, but it's the Princeton Lectures on Biophysics. And these were really formative. He brought great people together and had them give two hour long presentation so that you could really get into the science and learn something. Uh, and I have to say this was, this was incredibly important in my transition from being someone who you know, dabbled a little bit in biophysics to someone who started to see that there, was a, there were real possibilities here. Um, pushing on, I did, I got, did get to do another sabbatical in my life at, at this also lovely place, which is UC Berkeley. Um, and it was here that I really made the transition because up till that point, I've been sort of fooling around with these lattice structures and having, having fun. But when I was at Berkeley, I started taking classes in biology, uh, spending my time down the hill with the biologists, going to seminars. And that's where I found out that the biologists weren't just worrying about protein structure. They were interested in networks. And so here's from an early paper I wrote with Sidney Kustu on the nitrogen metabolism network. Uh, never published this. This is on the archives. You can look, check it out someday. But I realized, well, there's no way that the biologists are going to understand the dynamics of this network. Like there's too many pieces to just sort of wave your hands at. You're, you're going to need math and you're going to need some physics to make progress on this. And I realized that there was just an unlimited, an infinite frontier opening up as, as people were learning about these metabolic networks, gene expression networks, protein interaction networks. And so I, I decided that was it. I was gonna wrap things up and I was gonna uh, work on biology all the time. Now, around this time, NEC was also falling apart as a basic research lab. Um, so Chow and I were under a lot of pressure to, to get things done and move, move along. Uh, and fortunately, we both landed happily. Um, Chow at UCSF and me now at uh, Princeton along with Bill Bialik. And so here back in academia, it's a beautiful picture of the Icon Lab, where I would be giving this talk from if I was actually allowed in the building, which I'm not since I'm a theorist, uh, but someday I'll be back in there. And, and the reason that I ended up at Princeton is really due to this person, uh, Bonnie Bassler, who I met in another formative moment uh, at an airport in Mexico City. And I was at a meeting that I was at only because Stan Leibler had said, well, this is a meeting the physicists are probably okay at. You know, you can, you, you'll be safe at this meeting. So I said, okay, Stan, I'll, I'll go to this meeting. And there in the airport in Mexico City, I saw a group of people, they were chatting and they were talking about the new restaurant in Princeton. And I realized this is my moment because we had some connections to people in physics and engineering, but zero connections between NEC and biology. And so there were some serious, there were some people, there was some serious guy. And, and I was like, ah, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to talk to her because she, she seemed more approachable. She doesn't look that approachable in this picture. She looks a little too serious, but, but Bonnie was really you know, easygoing and talkative. And I thought, well, you know, she looks like a postdoc, but I'm gonna check it out. Well, that was the best decision I ever made. Uh, Bonnie turned out to be a superstar, um, you know, MacArthur genius, member of Howard Hughes, medical investigator, chairman of the department, but she was also a terrific collaborator and friend. And so, she sat with me on the bus up to the conference and explained to me what the whole conference was about. Uh, and that was the beginning of, of what is going on now, you know, 20 plus year collaboration with, with Bonnie and her group. And so again, I wanna emphasize that my career has been basically founded on these wonderful collaborations, um, many of which happened in a moment, some of which happened, you know, by chance in other ways. Um, but I would emphasize as I close here, how important that has been personally to my career in, in biological physics. And so here we go. What have I learned along the way? Uh, Ned, you are muted for some reason. Okay. 
I'm, I'm no longer muted, and I still believe in the importance of long-term collaborations, particularly between experiment and theory, people coming from really different backgrounds who can bring something together that, and create something new. And so along those lines, one thing I've learned is to talk to experimentalists. Um, you know, in, in the days in physics, I used to love talking to experimentalists, but by and large, if someone told you that they measured the conductance of some particular semiconductor structure, you know, that, that was all the information you needed. Whereas someone tells you they measured something about some biological system, you know, this thing has 4,000 genes, even if it's E. coli, it, it's paying attention to all sorts of things that the experimentalist, you know, doesn't write in the papers. It's super important to talk to them about what, how the cells were grown and, you know, what they were, you know, what strain they're using. But of course, it's also super important to talk to them because they have really deep ideas about what's going on. And so I, you know, basically as a theorist, come in and talk to people and then say, oh, well, you know, I can write down some equations that would, you know, basically be exactly what you're telling me, but, you know, we'll each bring our own thing to it. But, you know, there's, there's more than that, which is to always say yes to new data. That is, experimentalist comes to you, someone either you've worked with before, or particularly someone new, and shows you something, you've got to say, yes, let's take a look at this. Um, and, and, and let me give you an analogy. Imagine somebody, this experimental has worked on this data maybe for a year, getting the strains right, getting everything right to get this data. It's basically like somebody showing you their new baby. And actually, this may not be a very good looking baby, but if you say, that's an ugly baby, I prefer not to look at it. Do you think that person is gonna show you any more babies? I don't think so. And furthermore, you know, like, like new babies, new data, you know, can get cleaned up a little bit. It, it starts looking better with time. So always say yes to new data. That's something that I strongly believe. I also think it's important to try new things. Not, you know, you, you may be an expert in this field and that field, but, you know, it's possible you go into a new field and that you then are going to do something that you, only you would do in that field. Uh, I feel that there's a, there is a kind of magic that happens uh, because each person is different and each person is going to do their own thing. And as a result, you know, if you stay in exactly the same field too long, well, you've done the things that you're going to do. And maybe it's time for you to try something new where you're going to bring your unique approach to that new thing. Um, important though, in the end of all, as I said, it's to focus on the people, not just the papers. Um, you know, the people in the end, for those of us who are, you know, getting on in age, you know, those are our most important product, not, not our papers. And in fact, you know, it's really in the end, the, you know, the, the, the people who make the difference and who make our, our field what it is. Um, and in to doing that, you know, pay it forward. I personally had many, many advantages. I look, listening to some of the other speakers, I realized that I've been privileged from the very beginning. Um, so I try to pay it forward and not just to people you know, who look like myself or talk like myself, I feel like, you know, it's important to, to, um, you know, you know, share what you can with, with, with everyone from diverse backgrounds, um, or wherever they may come from, even if, even if it takes a while to learn to, to communicate. And so finally, last but not least, make sure to have fun, uh, particularly again, as, as I get older, uh, my motivation, you know, I, you know, I've written enough papers at this point, I don't, I don't need to, write one more, but I do still enjoy having fun. And uh, as long as I can find problems that are fun, uh, I'm motivated to, uh, to keep going. And so with that, I will acknowledge all the great students, postdocs and colleagues I've had. And I did, went without mention, but I have a great family too. And they've helped me not take myself or the, the uh, ups and downs of, of biological physics too seriously um, and have been a great support to me all along. And with that, I will, I will close and happy to answer any questions people might have. Thank you so much, Ned. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, we are running a few minutes late, so I think we have time for one or two uh, quick questions and then we can take the discussion for the breakout rooms. Um, if you Are have you, a question. Yeah. Can I jump in with a question? Please. Um, Ned, I'm dying to find out what the hot new restaurant in Princeton was. Um, but my real question to you is, did you ever think of becoming an experimentalist? I, I think it was Triumph Brew Pub, which is, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, from the very, very beginning, um, I was interested in theory. As, apparently as a, small, as, a, as a small child, I would ask my mother, 
you know, what, what number do you like more, 385 or 417? And, and somehow I was always fascinated with sort of the, 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 I'm not a mathematician, but somehow sort of the, the th ideas of math floating around always, always appealed to me. Super, thanks. Can I ask a question? Yes, Next. please go ahead, Stephen. Um, yeah, hi. I, I have a question about when you were switching to biology from physics and when you decided to do that, and if that was after you were already, you already had a faculty position and did you have pushback from your department because, you know, you're, you're changing your field of research. That wasn't why they hired you. Did you have difficulty with grants? How was that transition? Okay, so this happened while I was at, at, at NEC, this industrial lab. And I have to say, you know, there are not really that many opportunities for people to join real research labs like that anymore, but it was a great place for exactly that reason. Uh, I didn't have to get grants, you know, in an area that I was already an expert. I didn't have a tenure to worry about there. Uh, I, I had a modest budget, but I was absolutely free to do what I wanted. And I have to say that was just a, a wonderful thing. And I, you know, I wish there was more of that. Um, and, and I wish pharmaceutical companies and so on would step up and be those kind of places for people interested in biological physics. But so far, that's, that hasn't really come to pass. There's, there are no equivalent of Bell Labs or IBM or, or Xerox or this NEC lab that I was at. All right. Thank you all very much. And thank you, uh, Ned, again for the talk. Um,